What is author marketing mastery through optimization, you ask? I'm going to tell you. It's the best way for us authors to make a living selling our books. Are you tired of hearing gurus tell you your book is only good enough to be a lead magnet for services? Are you tired of feeling like you have to be a slave to social media and then frustrated when that time doesn't actually help you sell books? I was too, until I found Ammo. Ammo is the only program that reliably produces results and it works for anyone. Is it hard work? You bet. Do you have to overcome some of your own prejudices to make Ammo work for you? Absolutely. But rather than being another program that rah rah shish goom boss tries to get you emotionally excited only to offer unclear methods, Ammo shows you how to design profitable ads step by step through a unique, never before tested formula. The founder, Steve Piper, is a data loving, formula driven author who escaped the kingdom of Amazon to build a platform for himself where he sold directly to his readers and built a loyal following. With Ammo, you know who's reading your books, how to contact them, and what they want to read next. If you've always been frustrated with Amazon's wall of mystery, of not knowing who's reading your books, of losing 50 to 70% of the hard earned money you make through book sales, Ammo solves all of those problems by putting you in the driver's seat and showing you how to fulfill your books directly to your readerships. Click the link in the show notes to learn more. We've got to start out with a little correction uh, toward the middle, latish end of the episode. I claim that TRBM is close to 300 episodes, and uh, in reality, we're launching 179. Right now, this is episode 179. So um, what I did was a little bit of fast math in my head uh, that was really bad fast math. If I'm doing two episodes a week for a little over two years, then... I should be at 300. <laughs> I'm a writer, not a mathematician. Uh, although I have uh, said of myself that I'm pretty good at fast math and that's clearly wrong. Also, I could have been bragging. I don't know, maybe maybe in my heart at that moment, I felt like anything less than 300 was, was pitiful. That's a possibility too. Uh, I don't have that moment to reflect on what I was thinking at the time, but it certainly is not something that stood out to me until I listened to it. And as soon as I heard myself say it, I was like, well, buddy, I'd be shocked if we're at 300. So there's there's two parts of my brain working at once. Not that you care, but hey, again, I always try to give you the like freshest, rawest truth that I possibly can because that is one thing that is severely lacking in the arts world is uh, we're all trying to jockey in position for uh, looking the best. And I am not interested in looking the best, though I hope you love my books, which you can read. I'm working on re-scripting the middle ad for the Luke and Time Mysteries. My friend Shane, who's one of my early readers uh, slash beta readers slash editors, um, I do things differently perhaps than some people do. I'm getting off track. He uh, wanted the ad copy for my ads because he felt like uh, we could we could you know kind of tighten them up a little bit. So I'll be doing that. Um, and I want to invite you, if you ever listen to something on the podcast that you want to respond to, I love hearing from you. I love when you email me. If you're subscribed to Substack, then you can reply to the email you get with the episode link, uh, and that'll come directly to me. You can also email me at jodyjsperling at gmail.com. Um, I, I really love hearing from listeners, readers, people who are engaging with my work, because sometimes it can feel like you are talking to uh, thin air. Like for example, right now I'm recording this sitting at my dining room table in front of my laptop. I've just edited the episode and I'm getting ready to put the front matter on. Looking at a wall, empty chairs, nobody's here. You can probably hear a little bit of an echo because of that. But you know, hey, this is, this is a low production uh, process. I'm trying to give it to you, just giving it to you. <laughs> Hope you love it. My guest on today's episode is the amazing and talented Mickey Kennedy. I wanted to say uh, Andy Rooney, Mickey Rooney, Mickey Rooney. I wanted to say Mickey Rooney, but it's not Mickey Rooney. It's Mickey Kennedy, who arguably knows a whole lot more than Mickey Rooney would about press releases. Mickey Kennedy has a thriving business called E-Releases 
where he will handle national press releases for authors like you and I. If you're at the point in your career where you wanna start focusing on national press releases to get more attention around your books, this is an episode you'll wanna pay close attention to. Uh, the episode starts out talking a lot about the challenges of fiction, and so that'd be something to talk a lot about uh, if you reach out to the people at uh, e-releases. What can they do for novelists? Sounds like they've had some success in some places, but this is challenging. Is that any surprise, novelists? Is that any surprise that we're going to meet some unique challenges? Here's what I would tell you. No matter what you do, whether you reach out to Mickey's people at e-releases or you continue to huff it yourselves, stay positive. It changes everything. I know it sounds, I, I keep doing this and I need to get out of this, by the way. I'm gonna get out of this. I'm done telling you it sounds woo-woo because it's just true, true. <laughs> it's true. Be positive. Think about the things you want. I had my friend, I'm, I'm going to not use any gender or name, but I had a friend who recently uh, was saying that this person felt like their books were long and that it was a chore to ask people to read the books. And I got back and I said, stop disparaging your books. And the person said, I'm not disparaging my books. Uh, I think my books are great. It's just I realized that other people might feel like they're long. And I said, you are right now projecting what you actually think about your books onto other people. Actually, I didn't say that part. I'm saying it right now. If you find that you're using negative language surrounding your books, even if you're projecting it onto your readers, uh, onto anybody else, you are the one who feels those feelings. You're the one who has those fears about your work. You fear that it's long. You fear that it's boring. You fear that it's uh, not tight enough. You fear that the prose is, is, is lacking. Whatever it might be, if you say that other people will feel this way, it is indeed your fear about your work. And there are two ways to look at this. One is, can you dig in? Is there something that you could change in the physical realm that would erase that fear because you would know you would address something because there is a part of us that is communicating on an intuitive and a logical and an emotional level to say, hey, there's a problem here. Um, when people started saying Lyle eats too much in the Luke and Time Mysteries, my first inclination was, oh crap, I really made a mistake. And the more I sat with it, the more I became comfortable with how much Lyle ate. I went through a long process of freaking out because of what other people were saying. But to that moment, I never had that fear. And when it was brought up, it eventually resolved because I looked it in the face and said, this is who he is. Now, here's something interesting, is that I responded to my readers. And so in later books, he eats progressively less. I made that choice on purpose, even though it wasn't an issue with the first book where he ate the most. So there's, there's layers to this conversation. You can retain who you are, and there can be multiple right answers, but if you care about reaching the most readers, you also wanna be sensitive to what people are picking up. And if that means uh, choosing a different abundance to, to go after, then go for it. That's what I got to say to you right now. You're gonna hear a lot of this kind of conversation in my episode, in my in my talk with, with Mickey Kennedy, because uh, it's just how this publicity thing works. We're always trying to walk the tightrope of being true to ourselves and delivering a message that reaches a large, robust audience if we want lots of readers. So without further ado, this has been a long one. Thanks for sticking with me. Please enjoy my conversation with Mickey Kennedy. This is TRBM Ammo Edition. If you're a published author and want to make a living writing books and selling them to avid readers, you've come to the right place. There's simply no program that's more successful at driving readers towards the books you've written. So the only thing you have to worry about is writing a great book. And the system with enamel takes care of the rest. Thanks for listening to this conversation. I'm Mickey Kennedy. I founded e-releases. It'll be 25 years in October. And I help small businesses, authors, speakers, and other professionals get visibility through press release distribution. Awesome. Okay. Uh, how'd you start doing it? 
Um, I was finishing up an MFA in creative writing in um, Northern Virginia uh, and specializing in poetry. And I was just assuming I was going to wait tables and write poetry in the evenings. And that was going to be my life. And yeah. I did that for a summer and it seemed like every joint ached, my back ached, my, my knees ached for being on concrete for 10, 12 hours a day. Yeah. And I just felt so emotionally and psychologically spent after a shift that I wasn't getting any reading or writing done. So I was like, I need one of those safe office jobs. And I got uh, hired at a telecom research startup as employee number three. And because I had a writing background, they said, figure out press releases and send them out for us. And so I did okay. that and I got really good at it, um, sort of nice. working with data and numbers and figuring out what the stories were behind it, because it was all, you know, sort of story driven. Journalists are looking for a story. We have data. So I just tried to flesh out where the stories were in that data. Sure. Okay. I, I'm I'm curious. Um, one one of the interesting things is that we come to a point in our careers where uh, we need other people to do certain things for us. So at this point, the the meta kind of thing is you have somebody reaching out to podcast hosts to get you scheduled and have conversations. Um, when was it that you realized your time was better spent doing other things? Because if you were great at writing press releases. I guess my my head is telling me you'd be great at writing a podcast pitch to get on a show. Um, sure. does, does that make sense what I'm asking? It does. So um, during the early part of the pandemic, uh, I was stuck at home, as was everyone else. And I had done a few podcast interviews and someone had reached out to me and said, we schedule people for podcast interviews. I was like, well, I don't need yeah. that. So I went on a few websites and uh, found podcasters and got really good at booking myself. Uh, but after about 80 or 90 bookings, I just felt like my time would be better spent focusing on, you know, delivering education and content, let someone else handle the scheduling and, you know, putting me together with other people because it became a nightmare for me handling it by myself and figuring out yeah. who these people are when they reply from a different email address. And I'm just trying to match everything up. And it was, it was just not where my mind felt at ease. So I, I, I was sure. very comfortable passing the reins on to someone else. Makes sense. Talk to me a little bit about uh, the results that you've seen from being on podcasts, because I think that a lot of people listening to this show uh, want to know what are the the best ways that they can uh, get a, a bang for their buck. You know, if they're gonna if they're gonna spend an hour talking to a stranger on a podcast, uh, are they gonna sell some books? That's really what it comes down to. Sure. Um, obviously, this show you're not gonna sell any books because you're talking to a bunch of authors who are trying sure. to sell books. <laughs> right. But uh, you know, we want to we want to get places where we can get known, be credible, be an authority, but also to move some of our our hard work. Right. So um, originally, I was focusing mainly on just other podcast is specialized in marketing in general, because uh -huh. I felt like that was where my audience was. But after a while, I started opening up to other people. So I do podcasts with, you know, restaurant owners, with uh, people who make stuff. Um, there was one podcast of people who make stuff and it's predominantly they're on Etsy. And uh, I didn't think that that would lead anywhere. But I know of like 30 orders that have come through from people who said that they saw me on that podcast wow. and talking about, you know, uh, how uh, they themselves can market themselves through press releases. And so I, I find now I'm just open to anybody who's wanting to have a conversation and talk about how you can use press releases to to market yourself okay. and other other types of opportunities. So it's not it's not necessarily uh... If I'm understanding what you're saying, it's not necessarily the the uh, qualifying of the show, but it's just the fact that you're going to have a conversation and you kind of let the rest take care of itself. Right. Yeah. Because at this yeah. point, I've done like close to 300 podcast interviews. So uh, I, I, it's hard to determine which ones you worked really well, but I know that in aggregate, mm -hmm. they're all working and they're all sort Together. of getting people to learn a little bit more about PR and discovering the opportunities that exist there. Absolutely. Uh, what's your sense? How many of the 300 that you've done actually still exist? I know that, that, uh, the, the sad but also true reality is that um, most podcasts don't make a year and uh, very, very few make two years. What's your sense about how many of those podcasts even still exist? 
Um, that's hard to say. I think that the ones sure. that I booked were smaller ones and ones that were newer. So I think a lot of them probably don't exist today. Um, yeah. The ones that the booking agency does for me, they they sort of vet a really high quality uh, podcast. And so they are ones that I found generally stick around. But despite that, there's still about yeah. 20 or 30 that haven't posted my podcast yet. So they might be in a long scheduling or maybe they just decided it didn't work. And in one case, uh, I, I guess I was at the end of a podcast and I realized this guy doesn't have record on. And I'm like, oh, no. I don't think it was recorded. And the person's like, oh, yeah, I think it is. But it's never been posted. So I, I think uh, that person was just embarrassed and uh, sure. didn't want to admit that it, it was not recorded. It does happen. Um, I am fortunate enough that in uh, almost what I'm, I guess we're getting close to episode 300 now. I've never had that actually happen, but uh, I've certainly had those those like heart attack moments where you're like, oh, I did something really bad here. And now time for a little ad break. Have you ever heard of the Luke and Time Mysteries? If you're listening to this podcast, chances are you have. The host is also the author. The Luke and Time Mysteries are for anybody who likes a little R-rated action with a bit of magic, as well as characters who do incredibly unlikely things, such as drink two gallons of bourbon in a single sitting. It's local. It's place-driven. It's voicey. It's hard-boiled. And where does all of Lyle's food come from? Find out these details and more when you buy the Luke and Time Mysteries. Click the link in the show notes, and we have every format available. Don't miss your chance to get a 60% discount just for being a podcast listener. Now back to the show. The reason I ask a lot of these questions is because the people who are listening right now are really interested in selling books to readers. And I think one of the biggest uh, challenges that authors have is figuring out where to spend our time that is most valuable. What really caught my attention when your people reached out to me was press releases. Uh, my friend, Chris Talon, he's a roving co-host on this show. He was able to write some pretty stellar uh, press releases and get himself onto the news in uh, his area in Michigan. I tried to send out some press releases not long ago for an event that I did called Books for Brews, and um, I didn't hear back from a single person. And it was this like, I think I felt pretty defeated and pretty frustrated. So that was what really caught my attention is I wanted you to tell me, how do you write a press release that you get a response from? How do you get on the news for TV or wherever it might be? What do you do uh, that's that's different? that people take note. I think that um, the biggest thing is just sort of focusing on what differentiates you from any other author out there. What's, what's your yeah. story? Um, you know, sometimes it's the, the path that led you to write uh, could be an interesting mm. one. Uh, you know, there's a, always a human interest element. So, you know, your background, your story, your obstacles or vulnerabilities, anything along, anything along those lines can really help flesh you out as an author. But then again, also, the book that you're publishing, you know, what, what, what it's about, what, you know, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Um, I work with a lot of nonfiction people that do really well with press releases, but with fiction, it's a little bit more difficult uh, because yeah. it's harder to convey the stock, you know, the elements that make a piece of fiction. So, so delightful and interesting to read are things that are very subjective in a way. And it's hard to bring that across through a press release, but I think sort yeah. of trying to capture that and, um, you know, being committed to, to, you know, developing the press release and uh, a series of press releases and getting them out there. Um, I, mm. I, despite that, we've had fiction work for a few people. Um, yeah, there's one person who, um, Sam Jane Brown, I think, who's based out of the UK, has done like over a dozen press releases with us. And um, uh, I've noticed that her titles come and go on Amazon. I think she has four listed right now. Uh, but uh, she's she's done extremely well and been able to make it work for her. And I think that that per, uh, persistence C works, um, but also 
you know, redefining your messaging and learning from what got a little bit of inquiries and people reacted to and sort of letting that sort of develop uh, with other types of, you know, press release hooks or angles. Um, Sometimes it's like if there's something that contemporary that's happened that relates to the book, that's a great entry point into talking and discussing the book in context with what's going on, maybe Mm -hmm. national news or something along those lines. Okay. So, uh, you say not too many novelists, not too many fiction writers. Uh, Let's drill in a little bit and try to figure out together what makes a novel or a novelist appealing to the local media. Because, I mean, you're going to send press releases out to newspapers, although they're dying, um, to TV news stations, to radio stations. yeah, well, I, I think we're going to walk backwards, actually. So let's start out with that question. What what makes a novelist uh, compelling to those outlets? I think it's the a lot of them. It's the the plot. Um, you know, it's it's hard to to if you have a really interesting character to convey that in a press release that seems to relate to people, but people team tend to be plot driven and story driven. So if you have a really interesting plot. Um, I think that that uh, has a, a higher likelihood of standing out. Um, you know, if it's a situational event or, you, you know, a lot of times it's a, a crisis, you know, or something like that, there might be a way to sort of convey it in a way that would be um, relatable to uh, an audience or a reader. Uh, yeah. And I think that, that that's the sort of things that I would sort of broach and try to try to make work for someone who's, who's, who's working with fiction. With nonfiction, it's really easy or to get publicity because yeah. everybody who writes nonfiction is trying to bring across uh, elements that nobody else has done because otherwise you're writing right. the same book someone else has written. And so yeah. you, you really have what, you know, if in a business we call like a unique selling proposition, what's your USP, sure. what makes you completely unique. And I think for fiction, that's also happening, but it's just harder to convey because it it is sometimes yeah. uh, the art of someone's writing, the way they describe something or just the brilliance they have for dialogue and things along those lines. And I think that, uh, you know, pick out what your strengths are and try to get them in that press release. So if it is dialogue, maybe have a couple instances of dialogue within the press release, uh, yeah. you know, really great banter or something along those lines so that you're really conveying that across. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, you're right. Nonfiction tends to be easier in almost everything. So, so uh, a nonfiction author can typically write a book and use that book as a lead magnet and build a whole business on the back of a lead magnet. I'm going to give this book to you for free. Then you're going to come and I'm going to give you a service or whatever it might be. And uh, my my book itself gives me authority. But the weird thing about fiction is that that's not the case. The novel does not necessarily give you authority. You only get authority if a, a lot of people like the novel. And if a lot of people like the novel, they tell their friends about it. And you get sort of layers and tiers of interest going on. Um, I, I found it interesting what you're talking about in, in terms of like hooking people with your plot. What is interesting for me, and I, I don't know how we even talk about this because I want to use myself as an example for, for listeners. When I sent out my press release, I let people know, A, uh, this book is set in Omaha. I'm based in Omaha. B, uh, this book takes place in a lot of restaurants that are local to Omaha. Omaha, like actual restaurants that take place, uh, like events happen in real restaurants. And I would love to have an opportunity to talk with you uh, about the book and Books for Roos, what I'm doing. And so that was kind of the press release that I sent out was was letting them know it is relevant to you. The book takes place in real places around the town. And I'd love to get on the news and have a conversation with you about this event. I'm not even sure what I did wrong. However, I did have a great selling opportunity. I mean, even even though I didn't get featured on any news outlets, when I showed up, uh, I, I had spread the word far and wide and a lot of people showed up and I sold a lot of books. But I, I wish I had had the opportunity to get on KETV and different places like that. And I want to know what I did wrong uh, so that everybody listening won't do what I did wrong. Right. So. It's it's really hard to say. I mean, sometimes yeah. it's just timing. 
you know, that the people that are would be your ideal uh, journalist for developing out a story that's based on a on a novel just weren't looking at press releases that day. Uh, and huh. and so, it, you know, it, it, it does come down to a bit being luck. Um, the other thing, you know, maybe it, it, it's hard it's hard to say without looking at the actual press release, but I think that, uh, you know, in the, in the case of uh, David Merman Scott, I think is the guy's name who wrote a, a nonfiction book about using press releases for marketing. And it was called the new Bible of press release and marketing. Mm. Um, it took him 15 press releases for that book before he got pick up. Oh, right. And, you know, he kind of had to because that was his niche that he's talking about using press releases for marketing. And here he was, he wrote, you know, about a dozen that did nothing. And so mm. it is a bit trial and error and determining what the, the media will engage with. And I think that um, being an author, feel free to be creative. Um, you know, yeah. maybe if you have, um, you know, one thing, one one little two or three sentences that really speak to a lot of people, and they can stand, uh, withstand being pulled out of the the book. Maybe incorporate that into the press release. I feel like you know, load the press release up with as as much as you can to really define who you are and all yeah. the different little elements that make you who you are. Um, you know, I, I it, it's it's hard. I mean, I, fiction is really hard to get across. Um, I think that for a lot of people, getting local media is going to be the easiest. And you certainly don't need to pay a service like e-releases to get local media. Uh, as a matter of fact, when people call us and say, we're just looking for local media, I tell them, don't bother paying for the service because local media is so accessible to you. Mm -hmm. um, journalists uh, love to get tips and uh uh, pitches locally from local businesses, local authors. And mm -hmm. so if you just do the homework and figure out who covers, uh, you know, books, who covers the type of books that you've written, uh, uh, looking at their bylines in the paper, uh, reach out to the paper and ask for their mm -hmm. email address. Um, they may just yes. forward you to their phone line, but you just, just persist and just ask for it. They're members of the community. They're journalists. They're not like celebrities. You can get their email address. You can start a dialogue and communicate with them. Yeah. And uh, if you do this, you can create your own little local Rolodex of people uh, in your market that you can reach out to. And I think that you'll have a, a really good success with that. Um, I think that also having a really good quote prepared for the journalist is also another way to stand out because one of the things that people don't realize is having an amazing quote in a press release can really allow a journalist to build the story around it. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, you're an author, really come up with two or three sentences or less that are really just beautifully written, succinct, describe you, uh, describe, you know, maybe perhaps the book itself and, uh, and then, you know, add a few sentences of a pitch uh, mm. of, of what you're doing. You don't even have to write an entire press release for local media. They're willing to come back and uh, interact with you, uh, quite, you know, interview you, et cetera. Yeah. And if the same thing with the radio and TV, if there are uh, TV shows that you've seen that sometimes talk to local authors, uh, find out who the producer or booker of that show or that segment is. And again, ask for their email address and pitch yourself. Uh, don't be afraid to stand out and and, and put yourself out there. Um, local media is generally very uh, accessible. And I, I recommend people reach out to local media as often as they can come up with newsworthy ideas, uh, you mm. know, wh whether that's a couple of times a month or quarterly, uh, as you have uh, a newsworthy pitch, get it out there and, and try. Uh, over time, you will find it gets easier and you will learn what the local media will engage mm. with uh, by doing a few pitches. And then you can use that to you know test national markets uh perhaps even be willing yeah. you know to do a press release and I, sure. I i think that uh it also works with local bookstores um you know mm -hmm. i i've i've advised a lot of authors to reach out to local bookstores and ask to do a reading and they just feel like you know i don't know if it's imposter syndrome or what but they're reluctant to do that and i'm mm -hmm. like the way i would pitch it is ask them what's your least busy night and you're like, well, I'm going to do a lot of marketing. I'm going to put it on Facebook. I'm going to, uh, you know, reach out to the paper and get it in the calendar of events. And I'm going to get people showing up at your business on the least busy night. 
and I would love to do a reading. And if you couch it like that, most people are going to say yes. And I think, you know, and and it really does create a really good opportunity. What I've found is a lot of these can really snowball because once you feel a little more comfortable, uh, you know, getting this marketing out there and doing these types of things, it, it just it just really lends itself to you know repeat, uh, rinse, learn, and improve. Yeah. Wow, uh, I mean, there's so so much stuff you just said. Actually, uh, it, it feels like we we need to go back and kind of uh, get granular about a few things. So one thing that you said was newsworthy ideas. For me, and I think for a lot of the people listening to this podcast, newsworthy ideas is. Uh, unfortunately still too vague. I'm not sure what a newsworthy idea is. Uh, I created books for brews because I thought that that was a newsworthy idea. I didn't get a lot of interest around it. Uh, I know I did things not optimally, but I'm curious, how do you couch it? I think that's your word as newsworthy. How do you make somebody believe that what you're doing is newsworthy? Worthy. Um, because I, I like where we're gonna go in this conversation is we're gonna go from local to national. I love that you mentioned national media, and I think that some really big things can happen for novelists if they can get national attention. But first we have to be experts at uh getting the attention of local news. How do we make it a newsworthy idea? I think that you want to sort of couch your argument and your pitch um to something that would make a general audience or the audience that you're targeting care. And, you know, journalists are gatekeepers and their most uh, protected asset is their audience. And so they're deciding what to share and what will delight them and interest them. And so, you know, sort of reverse engineer, you know, I've got this book, it's, it's, this is the path that it took. How would I make an, uh, this type of audience care about this book? Is it, uh, you know, the, the protagonist, is it the, the plot or the journey, or is it, you know, the, 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 the writing or the dialogue, you know, pick up the strengths that you feel that an audience would respond to and lead with that. And I think that's, you know, uh, that's, it, it, it's really hard to, to sort of put your finger on it because with fiction, it's, there's so many factors that go into making a great book. And you, you're now being just, yeah. you have to decide what is it that you want to lead with. And I think that, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you, you know, lean on your readers, your friends and family who've been there and try to, you know, ask them what delighted them most about the book, uh, what, what interested okay. them, uh, most, what was, uh, uh, a, you know, a part of the book that really spoke to them and uh, really resonated. Uh, those might be little instances to sort of flesh out in a press release and share. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that other things, you know, are, you know, are there parallels in the real world that uh, or current events or news that you can bring out an element in the story. I, I think that sometimes I've, I've seen that work with people who've published a book three years ago and it's just languishing on the market and not really selling. And all of a sudden there's a current event that has happened and it just speaks to the book. And so they've done uh, press releases and been able to get some sales and interest and media pickup uh, by by doing that. And it just is unfortunate that every piece of fiction doesn't have a current event that's going to completely speak to the book at the moment that it's published. But if there right. is, the, these things align themselves, take advantage of them and look around for other opportunities to take advantage of, of certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are uh, audiences that you you may not think about. I, I know that uh, yeah, sometimes when you write about certain uh, you know a character having health issues and things like that, there are people out there in that community who have that condition for whom this book might speak to them, and you know make yourself yeah. available to that community as well. You have an MFA in poetry, correct? Almost nobody reads poetry anymore, and I mean it's a uh... I don't know whether I'm sad about that or it's just a fact of life or if it's always been that way. I think sometimes, I think sometimes you want to be doom and gloom. You know, I I hear people sometimes say like there are fewer readers now than ever before. Uh, I I think in abundance, I think that there are more than enough uh, readers of poetry and novels to sustain us and and give us lucrative uh, 
wonderful lives. So I'm not concerned about that. But I do think that there's a value at least in framing the conversation by uh, you have an MFA in poetry. Do you still work to build your your readership in poems? Um, where are you at with that right now? Right. So the the ironic thing is that once I started e-releases and the business started to take off, I I I didn't write poetry. So I took about twenty yeah. years off. I started back about five or wow. six years ago, and I've now completed two manuscripts. And awesome. I am sending them to contest or competitions because that seems to be what you do with poetry. Uh, and it's 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 sad because you know uh, twelve hundred people enter paying thirty dollars and they're sending their manuscript in, and one book usually gets published. And so far, I haven't had any success. I may eventually go the self-publishing route, but I'm still going to give it another yeah. uh, year or two. Uh, things just yeah. happen slow in the marketplace, but it's true. There's a lot yeah. more writers of poetry than there are readers of poetry. And I think it's always yeah. been that way, or at least in, I would right. say, contemporary history, it's been that way because it was like that when I was uh, a, a young student. And I think it's still mm -hmm. like that. I think that there is a lot about marketing now and having your own community um and so uh you know there's there's a lot more elements to it where you can sort of define and build your community um i've self-published a couple of uh, non-fiction books that are pr related and yeah. have done really well with those and i think it's yeah. just you know it's it's non-fiction it's on a particular subject and they work really well but it doesn't hurt that I also have uh, had about 28,000 customers in the life of e-releases and I can market to them when my book comes out and sell a lot of copies and have a lot of people who feel invested enough in me and my business that they're willing to give me a review without asking for them to give me a review. So uh, that's yeah. that's been fortunate as well. But um, when it comes to poetry, um, you know, no one's no one's getting rich writing poetry. Um, you know, maybe there's a couple of exceptions out there, but uh, sure. I used to work for Carolyn Forche when I was in oh, grad school, I, who oh, was there. And I oh lived with her gosh. for six months. And she, she talks about that. She has that poem about uh, ears on a necklace. The, the uh, Colonel. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. my God. That and poem. Anyway, <laughs> her advice to me was she's like, uh, I'm considered a best-selling poet, and uh, I have been in print almost since I was like in my early yeah. 20s and have stayed in print, the same books. And yep. she said that if you were to take every royalty that she had and uh, put it together, she's like, I wouldn't be able to pay for the the car that we're in right now. And yeah. so that that just gives you, you know, the, yeah. the true reality of it. Most of them are teachers uh, or also doing right. speaking engagements and things like that. And they're still not, you know, they're, yeah. they're not having lavish lifestyles for the most part. I got my uh, MFA from Eastern Washington University in fiction. Uh, Greg Spatz, Sam Ligon, um, really, really amazing teachers. Um, the world of literary fiction, the world of poetry, uh, I was surrounded by poets in the MFA program, is really difficult. So uh, I went into an interview with uh, Joanna Penn not long ago, and um, it was more contentious than I would have expected. Uh, she, she was, I, I don't think she was impressed by me. I think that she was uh, annoyed by me. I think that she didn't like me very well. I'm not sure why, but as we were going along, I made a similar comment to what you said in that I was like, uh, poets don't make money. And she said, well, you've clearly not seen the seven figure poets because apparently if you self publish poetry, uh, you can make millions of dollars. <laughs> I haven't found those poets, but she did. She did mention uh, a couple that that self publish and make a lot of money. It's an interesting thing to think. No matter what we do, where we do it, how we do it, if we channel the right things, just like a press release. Getting back to kind of the the, the topic, great things can happen. But figuring out how to, I don't want to say hit the jackpot because I don't believe that this world is luck. I wouldn't have a podcast about marketing books if i believed that it was luck there'd be no point in speaking to my listeners about how to market their books if i thought this was luck but i also think that there is a sense of 
Um, the, the, the road is narrow. I think that's as close as I can get. The road is narrow. Figuring out exactly how to walk on this really slim margin in order to create the kind of love around us that we do amazing things. Um, there's not exactly a question here, but I do want to hear your response. I, I think if I'm correct, you know where I'm going. And so I just want to give you a second to kind of respond to that notion. Right. I think that there there are always exceptions, and but it's really hard to sort of model yourself after them. I think like, is it Rupi Carr, the poet who has sold probably a phenomenal amount of, of books, starting, I think, with a self-published book. Um, but she had a huge audience that she nurtured on Instagram. I think mm. that she had hundreds of thousands, perhaps even over a million uh, followers on Instagram where she would post little ins- inspirational vignettes uh, from her mm-hmm. poems. She writes a certain type of poem that is, you know, not what most MFA poets would consider high art, uh, but they speak mm-hmm. to people that, you know, there, they are, you know, the, the greeting card type little messages that work really well. And she's also <laughs> does. <laughs> you're, you're so kind. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but the thing about it is, you know, she probably touches more people with her art than the average poet. And so I can't yeah. discount her completely because it's what she's doing is of a different aesthetic than me, but it it, it is speaking mm. to people and people yeah. t- really love her. I mean, she's been picked up by traditional publishers and probably multi-million dollar deals. You know, her stuff yeah. just sells phenomenally. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, it can't be expected of everybody to be told if you want to exceed, uh, succeed with, uh, you know, publishing a novel, you have to go out and get a few hundred thousand followers on Instagram and other places. I, it just doesn't seem yeah. rational. But I think that there are uh, there is a community that's out there, and I think that everybody yeah. should sort of seek those out and develop them and sort of use uh, yep. social media. Um, you know, you don't have to become an expert at it, uh, but, uh, you know, build your own audience, get an, you know, getting a website and an email list and yeah. being able to build a community. Because uh, if you can capture the people who buy and interact with you once, the likelihood is mm-hmm. they'll be receptive to buying your second book and your third yeah. book. And you can sort of build your following, yes. even if it yes. starts out small, uh, it, it certainly can grow and it's something you can count on. Yeah. All right. So what I want to do, and and this is maybe as much for me as it is anybody else listening, because I don't, I don't know how much my listeners are uh, familiar with these people, but it'll help me understand you and, and our shared journey. Uh, Dennis Johnson, poet. Are you familiar with his poetry? I am also okay. uh, very familiar with his uh, fiction. Great, great I story writer. Freaking, freaking love Jesus, son. What a great book. I mean, I just actually read the first story in that collection of my friend yesterday out loud. Uh, um, I, I was aware of how long I was reading as I was doing it, but I just needed her to hear that story and absorb it. Okay. Uh, Ted Kuzer. I have to assume Ted Kuzer is, is on your radar. Yes. Mary Oliver. Yes. Jim Harrison. Less so, uh, f- yeah. Familiar with, but yeah. yeah. He he wrote a lot of fiction. He wrote Legends of the Fall, obviously, but but um, yeah. He wrote he wrote some poetry, and in, in he was beloved in France, and um, I think obviously known in in the states because of his fiction. There's there's a, a few others on my shelf that I kind of want to grab. The reason I'm asking you this specific question is when we talk about poets, uh, I think of Ted Kuzer specifically, and. Um, he's also a fellow Omaha guy, or I guess Nebraska, probably more Lincoln than, than Omaha, but he's a fellow Nebraska guy. He's been poet laureate of the U S uh, for a, a good amount of time. He was good friends with Sorensen. Um, Sorensen was on the cabinet with John F. Kennedy and also a Nebraska guy, Mary Oliver and Ted Kuzer and Sorensen are all these poets who are just on the edge of mainstream so that I think that there are people who, if, if they are poets, maybe look down on them and think like, Oh, you know, you write sort of not really deep poems. I'm interested to hear from you, not what you think of those poets. I wasn't setting you up for that. I'm interested to hear from you. What is the balance of writing 
great poetry that you want to bless the world with. Uh, and yet, if there's any chance that you can make a living as a poet, do you think about those things? Is that is that like is that in you? Do you get what I'm asking? I, sure. I'm, I'm terrible at asking questions right now, but I, I do know where I'm going. So <laughs> good luck. <laughs> right. So I, 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 I do think about what my life would be if I had pursued poetry more, like became a teacher or, you know, uh, like a lot of other people in my MFA program went and just continued to teach at universities, mostly as adjunct or part-time basis mm -hmm. and continued to do picking up tutoring gigs and all kinds of things my life would be very different um yeah. but uh I, I also feel like because my life is so different uh professionally then it's not really writing i can be creative in press releases mm -hmm. and brainstorming and things like that but i'm not really exercising my poetry i feel like when i you know i i, I put everything away for the day that i can then I have a clean slate to turn to for poetry. So I feel like it, mm. I, I don't regret it very much. Um, I, I also realize that there's just not a lot of money, you know, with, with poetry. Uh, it, it's so I don't have any illusions of, you know, what it would, what things would be if I started to get, you know, uh, you know, you know a, a really good publishing record and things like that. So um, I, I, I just feel like it's something that I, it feeds me to write and I do it a lot f just for me, but I also share it with family and friends. Um, and uh, but I, I also feel like some of the subject matters that I encounter make myself dangerous to share with my clients or customers in the press release world, because yeah. uh, I, I think that I, I would probably turn a lot of them off and uh, maybe alienate some. Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I like how you uh, framed that, because um I want to know from you. I, I don't. I don't want to take this anywhere that you don't want to go. But um, you are in a minority, uh, and I'm curious how much of writing is like therapy for you. How much of poetry is therapy for you, uh, based on the fact that you are in a minority? Are you Are you writing to resolve uh, the way that you've been treated in your life, the the feelings you've had, the the way that you've arrived where you've arrived? Because I think that you are publicly um, braver than many, many people. And I'm curious, does that come from your writing or is that just a choice? Like, I, th I think that it does come from my writing. I think right. that I use it as therapy to get these painful things out, you know, my childhood, my life, um, you know, sort of the things that I've, I've gone through, uh, you know, I, I, I came out very late in life as a gay man who at the time was mar still married to a woman and sort of navigating that. And it's, it's been, um, it's been a strange journey, but there's not a lot of people writing about the journey that I've been on, you know, and yet I know that there are others like that. And so I feel a need to sort of get it out there on the page. And I've had really good luck getting, you know, picked up uh, in in poetry journals. And I think that a lot of it is because it's it's telling a narrative that isn't really talked about very much and it it's it's painful and raw and um yeah. you know I, I feel like i'm doing it justice with my writing cool um so my my mom uh and dad were married for 11 years uh my mom uh got divorced and came out um a couple years after after the divorce my sister is gay uh i look at the lives that they lived and i think of the pain that they felt. Also, uh, I grew up Southern Baptist. I didn't know what I didn't know, you know? And I was hurtful to my mom, really, really. I mean, like, I actually had my, like, quote unquote, come to Jesus moment when I was a bit older. And so I got really zealous and I wanted her to know that I loved her so much. I didn't want her to go to hell, <laughs> you know? Ouch. Mistakes in the way that I saw the world. But uh you you're fervent when you when you embrace a way of being or or anything and I, i'm actually going to bring this back to marketing um when you first take something into yourself whatever it is you have to do it with all of you or it doesn't stick 
And I think that uh, we hurt people because of that, not intentionally, but because we're trying to make it land. I'm curious with that kind of framework, when you realized you were gay, um, did you hurt people when you came out? Did, did you have to like distance yourself from people? Uh, like I said, we will come back to marketing with this, but I'm, I'm curious about that. I think so. I think there are some people, it is difficult to see me in that light. And yeah. I, I think for other people, it, it wasn't a problem. And so, but, but, it, but it did, there was a shift. There were people who, who knew me before I came out and then, you know, mm -hmm. to, after I came out, I was a different person to them. And yeah. uh, for whatever reason, you know, they, they didn't want to nurture the relationship or carry it forward. But a lot of people did rally around me and were appreciative. And, um, you know, uh, it, you know, we're, we're open and, and loving and, you know, everything that you would want. Um, yeah. You know, that that being said, there are uh, you know, me and my mother have a don't ask, don't tell policy. Uh, oh. She doesn't want to hear it. And oh, she, wow. she doesn't, she okay. doesn't want to talk about it. And so we just cool. ignore it and oh. it's just there and it festers and it shows yeah. up in poetry and wow. <laughs> all of okay. that. So you've made the choice to be in a relationship with her and to uh, respect her desire to just pretend it doesn't exist. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So how this relates to marketing is that uh, we have our books we have our press releases, we have all of our stuff. And in order to be successful, we have to make this really, really weird choice to tell people about our books, to tell people about what we're doing, to let people know that we are an author and that they can buy our work. You don't know, unless you are a writer and you have a book to sell, how flipping hard that is to tell somebody, I have a book. I would like it if you would buy the book. I do not wish to give you the book because I spent X number of years or months writing said book. Will you please buy the book? Talk to me a little bit about that. Talk to me about that that moment because I mean that's that's it, it really is for me almost an equivalent of coming out and and I'm not trying to uh, reduce that moment for you, but I really do think it is one of the hardest things in the world to let people know that you have something that they should take and that they should love you because of it or in spite of it or with it uh, to incorporate it. Does that make sense? And, and and if I have offended you, please forgive me again. No, I, I, yeah, I, if you have it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, it is it is a very strange position we find ourselves in as authors because um, there's part of us who just believe that if we're great authors, the, the readers will find us, the customers will find us. But the truth is you know, it does take marketing. You do have to put yourself out there. You do have to, to test and try every different little angle and hook to get people interested. And uh, it, it, it is it is the unfortunate nature of, of being an author. Um, we used to only work with self-published authors at e-releases. Um, mm. But over the last 10 years, it's completely shifted. We work with predominantly traditionally published wow. authors now because- okay. They don't provide marketing for the most people. Yeah, they, there's exactly. still a few major uh, authors that they may devote marketing to, but most of them have outsourced it and told the authors you're on your own when it comes to marketing. Mm. And so everyone's expected to get themselves out there. And I think that one of the you know ways in which I think um, you can stand a better chance is to be completely vulnerable. Um, mm. I think that uh, for me, I feel like, uh, when when I do get published, I, I feel like the marketing of it's going to be actually pretty easy. I think yeah. that I have a message that uh, hasn't really been represented in poetry. Um, mm. I think that I have a story that's very unique. Um, I think that some of my poems are really skating uh, the definition of, is this art? Uh, I, I've actually mm. been told by one famous poet that he doesn't believe some of the poems I wrote rise to the level of art. He feels they're offensive. Oh, wow. And oh, wow. I, okay. I feel very comfortable defending them. Uh, so wow. I, I feel okay. like the marketing standpoint for me is going to be a, a little bit easier than the publishing route, you know, getting published, okay. getting published is going to be the, the hard part for me, but I, I yeah. do feel like as a marketer, um, I, I, I can make it work because I'm willing to be vulnerable and go there and mm. share, you know, uh, 
the you know the fact that i was uh, abused growing up uh you know mm. physically emotionally so actually uh and i i'm i'm willing to share that and have the poems wow. share that experience as well and i think that you know are there vulnerabilities with you as the author the you know the path that, that took you to write this book or within the book itself the the vulnerabilities yeah. of perhaps the main character or or certain mm -hmm. people in there um you know people relate so much to human interest stories and i think that uh you know just ripping it off and being completely exposed and vulnerable uh can go a long way i've i've seen people uh get you know over a thousand books sold uh, by just sharing their story on social media um right. i i've had a person who shared the 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 journey of their father who wrote a book of poetry and how he felt like nobody cared about him or it right. and it was just a beautiful little love story that this uh, son had written about his father right. and it went completely viral and the book just sold out uh yeah, you know amazing. and uh um i think that you know those are the things that that excite people. Um, the book itself yeah. wasn't very good, uh, I will admit, but the the story was just beautiful. The son sure. just sharing his father and how hurt the father was over this because he had given so much uh, for yeah. it. And I think that yeah. sometimes if you can convey that earnestness and the huh. you know and, and put the beauty of the author forward, people will respond and, and buy the book and it would have been even more fitting if the book had been a really good book but in the yeah, in that exactly. case it wasn't but you know the yeah. important thing is um what worked so well is that human interest element and i think that if you can bridge that and get that into a press release or into a pitch to uh people in the media and and see if they respond you know you can test it locally mm -hmm. um and be vulnerable and see if you can get some local interests and if it works then that would be a good test to try it on a more national level really really like how you you know, wrapped all the way back to press releases in terms of the local press release so supposing that books for brews went better for me um and uh everybody who's listening to this podcast for a little while knows kind of what, what books for brews was um what i again what i did was reached out to local restaurants to see if i could have an event at their restaurant where my novel uh had actual scenes and um i i got four people to agree or four restaurants four business owners to agree to have an event um the first one was a coffee shop and they didn't do any personal publicity. Uh, I showed up there and I had a, uh, an author friend of mine. She was actually a professor of mine in my undergrad. Uh, and I sold three books. She sold zero. It was embarrassing. I was so sad that I had her come. I felt really responsible. Um, the evening was a place called Block 16. I try to shout them out anytime I can. They're kind of a, like a burger and fries joint, but they're like upscale. They won a James Beard award. Um, and the owner was so excited to have me. She uh, like did her own personal publicity rush for me and told everybody I was going to be there. When I got there, she was like, hey, I want you to make yourself at home. I've got these tickets and blah, 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 blah. And this whole thing. And she went up and down her line of customers and told everybody, uh, I've got an author here this evening. If you buy one of those books, he'll buy you a brew. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And I sold so many books that night. It was really cool. Um, I've got two more that I haven't scheduled yet, but after having learned the difference between like the reception at the coffee shop versus the reception at the uh, block 16, I was like, I know now how to create this. However, everybody listening maybe doesn't. And this isn't exactly a press release because none of my press releases uh, got accepted. But when do you know that you've got something? Like what, what are the signs that you've got something that that people are going to be excited about and how do you drill into it um it's hard to say i think that most people yeah. who write a book care so much about it they feel like it's got it and i think yeah. it's 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 you know nobody writes a novel because they feel like I, I, there's there's not something special about it yeah. i think that you really have to just sort of brainstorm 
within the book and within yourself and bring to light some of the elements that you feel are are the ones that mm. will resonate most with people. I think that uh, there's also, you know, when it comes to books, it is a lot about networking, you know, who do you have relationships yeah. with? Um, having a former instructor who uh, is willing to engage with their community uh, and, and uh, you know, share your book can go a long way. Um, you know, I, I asked Carolyn Forche for a blurb for my book and she's like, oh, I don't write those anymore because I just offend people. She says that uh, every time I, I, I tell people I write for one person and then someone else asks me, it's just a huge ask because it's so many dozens of hours reading mm. and trying to build together a beautiful blurb. And she says, I don't have the bandwidth for everybody to ask. So I just don't do them anymore. Mm. And, okay. uh, but she, but she says, but Mickey, I, 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 I love you. I champion your work. I will gladly, when the book comes out, share it with my social media community. And I know mm -hmm. that we'll sell many dozen copies of your book. And that's yeah. just one person, a former instructor of mine. Yeah. And so, you know, who are the people that you can network with and build relationships with? Uh, I know mm -hmm. another author uh, who has uh, their little community of other writers and authors. And uh, she uh, writes predominantly like romance type novels, but she's yeah. really good friends with other people in that community and they support each other. And when one uh, comes out with a book, she's got five of these people that are all championing to their audiences to go out and buy the book. And yeah. she does, she's never met these people. They only know each other through uh, Twitter, now X, and yeah. uh, and they've developed their little community. And so I do believe that you can create your own little communities out there. Yeah. Um, you don't necessarily need to have millions of followers, but you know, find people that are in the same space as your book, uh, interact with them, share with them organically. Um, mm -hmm. You know, after a while, when they recognize that you're someone who reposts their stuff and comments on their things and, you know, they follow you back and stuff like that, then, you know, when you are pitching yourself, they're more receptive about reposting or sharing with their community. So just try to yeah. find these organic connections because um, they're the, they're the things that matter. Uh, same mm -hmm. thing with local media. When I, when you reach out to them, you know, uh, don't feel that you're, pushing necessarily just pushing a product but you're you're trying to develop a relationship with them uh yeah. may, maybe you comment on something that they've written that you thought was just very astute and beautiful and yeah. point that out before you you give them a pitch and all of a sudden you know that they're they're that's going to cut through a lot of the corporate uh uh, blinders that come up when you're pitching right. someone because you've really made a personal connection yeah in in time this conversation is happening before my next Wednesday episode drops, but by the time this episode drops, the episode will have also dropped. Um, I had Andy J pizza on a podcast. Um, I was at Cincinnati comic-con uh, last week and I'm sitting in the lobby of the Cincinnati comic expo um, on Friday. So, so fortunate that it was early enough that there weren't a ton of people milling about. It was fairly loud. I didn't have my headphones. I didn't have my microphone. Uh, the, the audio quality will certainly not be great, but, uh, and I, I told him this too. It's, it's just the truth. Like he was my number two get there's Stephen King. And then there's Andy J pizza for me. Those are the two guys that I so, so wanted on this podcast. And, um, I reached out to him. What, what I think, really landed for me in what you just said is that um all i have done is just show love to andy for quite a long time you know commenting on his posts letting him know what a cool guy he is listening to all of his podcasts uh leaving ratings and reviews and and just just love 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 sending so much love his way and so when i finally reached out and i said hey i would love to have you on my show he said, yeah, let's make it work. And uh, it was it was the most exciting moment. If you don't know him, by the way, uh, Creative Pep Talk is his podcast. Uh, he is a designer, an art designer for uh, like uh, Warby, uh, the, the glasses Warby Parker. I always get their name wrong. Um, he's done some, some artwork for Target and different things like that. Um, and he's just interviewed like so many amazing people, but honestly, he does a lot of solo episodes and, um, speaks to the struggle 
than it is to create meaningful art, how we keep going, how we create really meaningful art. I can sense that that's what you do. And I like that. Um, my question for you in closing is why dinosaurs? <laughs> I don't know. I've always been fascinated by dinosaurs. So I have a little fossil collection as well as art and things like that. I, I feel like it's uh it's just something that just fascinated me as a child that we have these little remnants of munch monsters and creatures that existed on earth before us. And I, I just find that yeah. fascinating. Absolutely. Where can people find you and learn more about your service and, and what you can do for people? Like give your, give your full pitch. Sure. So um, e-releases.com is our website. Uh, we're accessible through email, chat, and phone. We have no salespeople, no quotas or commissions. You'll just speak to an editor when you call or chat with us. Um, all of my social media is on the lower right. Um, LinkedIn is the only one that I personally participate in. I have people who handle the rest for me. Uh, and I have a free masterclass uh, that's about an hour video. That's a great place for someone to start who's considering PR. It's at ereleases.com slash plan, P-L-A-N. Uh, it's completely free, but it gives you a really good idea of the strategic types of press releases that work, the meaningful ones uh, that you have a better chance of getting some media success with. Um, and uh, I, I just tell people when it comes to, uh, you know, getting a book published and getting out there, it, it is to just market as much as you can and give it as much energy as you can. And I believe, you know, start locally, make mistakes there, but also figure out what works because then you can replicate it on a national market and, and sort of uh, try to get the successes that you got locally, nationally. Mm, awesome. Thank you for your time today, Mickey. Thank you. Thank you for listening to TRBM. The theme music was provided by the ever-talented Christopher Talon. And hey, if you liked what you heard, share this show with other readers because what's the point of telling stories if nobody's listening?